thanks to the organizers, the parents, I don't think you have a name, concerned parents or something. Is it parents in solidarity with Peace Must Fall? Oh, uh, the committee with a long name. <laughs> <laughs> Once again. Uh, and of course, the students here, uh, very inspirational stories from around the country. I've been moving around, I've been to a number of cities in the past week, as many cities, and what's happening here is happening elsewhere as well. And I think the kind of audience we have here says a lot about the movement we are building. Those of us who are trying to hold on to the hair we have, whose hair is getting gray by the day, understand that this is what we experienced in the 70s, in the 80s. The incredible creativity, the unity in struggle, the respect, the solidarity, the empathy. You don't have to be a single mother from the rural areas to empathize. You cannot feel what Comrade Dinia feels, but you empathize. And you are driven to action. What we've seen in the streets in a number of parts of the country of black and white students, of genuine anti-racism, not the crudeness of those people who elevate so-called race without understanding our struggles and the history of struggles, but people who understand why together we have to be anti-racist. People who understand intersectionality, people who understand you need to realize that patriarchy, worker exploitation, oppressions of different kinds work together, feed off each other. It's not the class struggle pure and simple because the class struggle takes gendered and racial dimensions depending on the context. And I think all these things we are realizing. I also want to say that not too long ago there were fees at schools. There were huge struggles. People tend to forget this. And those of us who took up the struggles for free primary and secondary education were accused of being crazy. Schools are going to fall apart. There are problems with fees. Now these are just pictures. The first one, I'm not sure you saw. This is an incredible picture by Mujahid, uh, Mujahideen Safuddin uh, when the students reached uh, uh, Lutuli House, UJ University of Johannesburg, and with students. It's uh, almost an aerial picture from the top of a building. And the previous picture, I wonder if you could get there, Martin. This is, it's now called Solomon Maslango House, like Bremer House, Alex's Zania House now. It used to be Senate House Concourse. Um, and these are students, it was an incredible program, matching the programs held at other universities. The one before that, Comrade Martin, is an incredible one. It's fortuitous that this billboard was an advert <laughs> making history. And that is when the two contingents from University of Johannesburg and Witz converged on the Nelson Mandela Bridge. I mean, it's just so evocative with meaning whether this bridge will fulfill the mission of the new generation, Franz Kanon, and you can wax lyrical about that. But it's also very significant because these are two universities in the same city, a stone's throw apart, and yet there is absolute competitiveness, competition. Who's doing 
better. Mm. UJ is great. Mm. Fitz is better. In the packing order, Fitz is higher. UCT is competing with Fitz. It's this perverse pursuit of ranking which undermines the struggle for decolonization <laughs> and social justice. It's also reproducing inequalities between universities. You heard some of the students speak about how even the police deal with uh, students differently if they come from poorer communities, working class communities, or if they go to certain universities. Our colleagues, and I see a number of my colleagues here, those of us who belong to different universities, get paid differently doing the same job. Sometimes it's even more difficult in institutions which are largely working class. Because you don't have the infrastructure, the resources, your classes are that much bigger and you don't have the kind of academic support other universities have. So these inequalities and these divisions perpetuate our system of racial capitalism, of oppression. And I want to say that even today, today it is even difficult for the middle class to send their kids to university. Many people are saying that those black kids who go to Vince, excuse me for saying kids, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to remind me. And please don't make me sit on the floor. <laughs> Even at Vince, at UCT, people tend to forget that many of those students from black women and middle class families are having great difficulties. It's different from established uh, middle class communities because a lot of those first generation middle class families support their neighbors, support other families. It's a different situation. And I think the kind of things that Dinya was saying are very real to us who are academics. We are confronted quite often on a weekly basis with students who come to us and give us really heart-wrenching stories about them having to drop out people, young people who are committed to their studies, who are enthusiastic, who have the initiative and who have the academic capabilities. And there are stories about people who hide and sleep in the libraries or in the toilets because they don't have accommodation. Or who do things that harm themselves and their dignity in order to get food to eat. So this is the kind of reality in a society we are living in. I'm talking about education, but it's not different with health with housing, with many other social sectors in our country. Now, what happened, what we see happening, didn't just come out of thin air. There was a level of leadership over a number of years. People slowly in their small areas working, asking questions. I know in Johannesburg, Witz and UJ staff and a number of students met every week for a number of months to talk about insourcing, to have a joint campaign. And we have an October 6 action at the two universities in a coordinated way. Students were then preparing for next year. And I need to say that now, because the discussion is happening throughout the country. People were planning for SONA, the State of the Nation Address, in February next year. <coughs> Students were saying, we know what's going to happen with the fee increase. 
We want to convene in major centers and in places like Solomon Mashlango House and elsewhere, perhaps areas like the Parliament or wherever. We want our parents to come. We want high school students to come. We want university, college students, TVET students to come. And we want to see if our president delivers on the promises. Of course, what they're not saying, but I think I'm wise enough, I've lived long enough, to know that the same thing that happened to Mubarak, etc., in the Arab Spring, might happen here. Yep, yeah. Yeah. And I'm telling you this now, because we were shocked when Witz management were not as cunning as some other managements and talked about the 10% increase. And reading the mood on the ground, we knew what was going to happen. It didn't take much if you spoke to students, if you understand the difficulties they were going through. That's when the explosion happened. We also knew, because of the resoluteness and the determination of students, that they already forced the hand of government. It was a fate accompli, even before the meeting at the union buildings. They had no choice but to accept the 0% increase. We knew that even before the sun rose on that particular day. And we've learned and we continue to learn a number of lessons. The new generation is learning these lessons and we are reminded again from time to time we do become despondent. And this is another lesson. The struggle takes different forms. There's an up and a trough and a high point and in those low points we should not get despondent. It's a lesson we learn. Some of us need to be reminded. We need to continue organizing. We can't just wait and think that all the time we're going to have these peaks of struggle. Marches to Parliament, to the Tuli House, etc. But we should take advantage of this quiet moment by consolidating, working, having the program. That's another lesson. Thirdly, the importance of the Student Worker Alliance. <laughs> Those of us who were in Sazam South African Students Movement in 1976 understood that. There were attempts, sometimes not very sophisticated attempts, but there was an impulse. But we were smashed by state repression. We lost many comrades, people went to prison, etc. In the 80s, it was a clearer understanding. There were very good, important campaigns around workers' struggles, and students were involved in that. Once again, students are learning that. that Student Worker Alliance is absolutely necessary. Thirdly, I think we have, and I, when I look around, I'm not going to mention names because there's just too many people. I've seen pictures of you, I've seen videos, I've heard what people in the different centres said. There, he, there is once again, as we could have predicted, the kind of people, those academics, who are not compromised to the extent that they're just interested in their own careers and upward mobility. They are prepared to, as Edward Said said, speak truth to power. Or as Arundhati Heroi says, speak truth about power. Hmm. And even though they might have big positions, they are our allies. And people like, by the way, our parents as well, although I'm firmly ensconced in the middle class now, 
not like other parents in this room. But I think it is vital to use what's happening at UJ, at WITS, at UCT, uh, at that institution still called Rhodes, uh, and, 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 and many other institutions, UWC. This energy of a number of academics as well, invariably it's the minority. I have no doubt in most institutions. But it's through that minority we can form what has been lacking for a long time. Genuine associations of academics. Unions perhaps as well. We need to explore that now. This is the opportunity to do that. I think it is vital. I want to say that a, a victory has been won in terms of a zero percent increase, as many students know, but the battle for free quality public education from preschool to university. ECD is arguably the most important period. People don't talk about ECD. We've neglected it under apartheid for obvious reasons, but post-1994 we continue to do that. So I think we need to understand education from pre-primary education to university. The other point is, I think this whole idea of the university as being a company and of the top managers as being the CEOs is wrong. Yes. They understand, you know, universities are seen in terms of their market orientation not in terms of the public good. There's a huge difference. We are following the model in other countries like the USA, etc. That has failed dismally. It's going to reproduce the, uh, the, the, the divisions we have in our country, the inequalities we have in this country. And privatization, outsourcing, competitiveness, user fees, racism, patriarchy, managerialism is part of that market orientation for many reasons that I don't have the time to go into right now. But I think that understanding a university in a different way, what, what will make a university a democratic university? And a colleague of mine, Alan Sears, puts it very succinctly, very briefly, in an article he wrote about student power, worker militancy, and the democratic university. He says, first, it needs to be grounded in principles of access that go beyond merely granting admissions to ensuring students from historically excluded populations have the opportunity to find themselves at the university. I think we all understand that very clearly. Secondly, it needs to be democratic in the sense that students need to have collective decision-making power over key issues ranging from budgeting to curriculum to classroom engagement. And amongst the victories we are winning, we still have a long way to go. But some of the universities, UJ, is talking about moving away from a Eurocentric curriculum by the way, the way we understand Eurocentric curriculum is also something we need to debate. It doesn't mean that everything that comes from Europe, whether it's Shakespeare or something else, must be jettisoned. No, no. In fact, those Europeans, whether it's Karl Marx or Shakespeare, where did they get their knowledge from? Where did the scientists get their knowledge from? It's part of humanity of Africa, Asia, South America. So I think the point we are making is those knowledges that we have been cut off from, those that have been excluded, must be added on, not things subtracted. That is the point. So African history, uh, various issues, and not just in terms of history, law, 
there's a very important field of law called critical legal theory, started by anti-racists in the West, largely black people, people of color. Why isn't that part of the legal curriculum? We talk about economics. Why are we just taught neoclassical economics? In fact, in a number of universities in England, I know that students are demanding we need to be taught, you know, what about uh, economics that's not just bourgeois? Yeah. Even social democratic, Marxist economics, it's very rich and it might speak to us and our reality more than what we are fed every day, even on our public broadcaster, with simplistic, ridiculous solutions. It's a mantra all the time. And you hear some people you don't expect to say that, hey, you are calling for free education, you want to tax the rich. Our money is going to leave, investments are going to leave. Which world are they living in? Our money is leaving in any case. Trillions of reds in illicit financial flows. Transfer pricing. And the comprador bourgeoisie, the crony capitalism, the trillion land, nuclear deal, the mega projects, the wastage, we have money. Now coming to that report that caused a lot of trouble, but before that I need to say, there are attempts, and I think the number of students, you know, part of the message we sent out on that day of union buildings is, after 21 years before coming to the financial nitty gritty, I think uh, Michelle has been generous, but I know yeah. my comrade sure, well, uh, she's going to knock me over the head. Uh, no violence. <laughs> See, I like to influence. Okay, so we said after 21 years of uncapped and uh, promises and the venality of our politicians, our students are too streetwise to be deceived, duped, hoodwinked, or bamboozled at the union buildings today. We said Gwede Mantash's comments at a press conference after the Lutuli House meeting, after receiving the students' memo, was an equal measure, was an equal measure, sophistry and flattery. But the students were not deceived. He failed to impress a number of the thinking students. We also say that we know that because of neoliberalism, universities' funding from the state has been declining very significantly over the years. And it is true that today what the universities get is lower than the Africa-wide average. I don't want to bore you with statistics, but this everybody acknowledges this, that in fact it's much lower than the global proportion, GDP, GDP the percentage of GDP spent on education. It is dwarfed by even those countries in BRICS. Uh, Russia's is 1.8%, India's 1.3%, and South Africa's 0.7% yes. of the GDP goes to higher education. So universities are being starved. Of course, and what do universities do? Pass on the cost to the students, right? They carry the burden. And of course, which are the programs that get cut? First are those that matter to poor students. The academic support, etc. The assistance with the writing workshop. And of course those donors that bequest the private, you know, I hear the Deputy Minister of Higher Education says, no, we must go to business and they must support us with our fees. What nonsense is that? Why must we go and bank that? 
Why can't we do with a, what's a lot of, you don't have to be a, a Marxist or socialist. Capitalist countries. Tax the one percent. Now, comrades, there's a wonderful piece that that left from uh, a PhD student at Vitz wrote. I'm not going to go through the whole piece, but he looked at Sembene and Osman's God's Bits of Wood. You know, it's about the 1947 uh, railway workers strike in Senegal. And uh, he, he talks about how that book, while it's an examination of the strike's socio-economic implications, it very, it weaves into the plot issues of gender, of patriarchy, of patriarchal arrogance, of apathy as well. And the point he is trying to make is that the book offers a really good way of understanding the present protest. And he says, our protest is not about one thing. Even if the ubiquitous hashtag fees must fall suggests otherwise, it is inherently intersectional, spanning various years, interrelated social, political, and economic issues. It is first about access to equal and quality education. It is about teasing out the ever so confusing intricacies of class relations in a post-apartheid South Africa or racial capitalism. It is about eradicating the painful exclusions and daily microaggressions which go hand in hand with institutional racism within those spaces that black people, that black women, that workers face on a daily basis in a number of institutions. And Katleko goes on to talk about why uh, this may seem like disparate ideological positions. They aren't. They all address the conditions of structural disenfranchisement under which many black students and outsourced workers languish every day. I want to move towards the end by also talking about, let's not forget the many other lessons, the incredible rise in solidarity and a single-mindedness amongst ourselves. We have our differences, but we deal with it, we debate it, we learn all the time. Students, workers, academics, throughout the country, many of them, the more matured, politically conscious amongst them, have set aside petty squabbles and ideological differences in its name. The distribution of resources, students and workers and parents getting food, sanitary towels, medication, legal aid, in the name of that liberation. And that gives us hope, a hope that the state talked about, the rainbow nation, etc. More hope than the Springbokka. <laughs> <laughs> that is the kind of unity we want through struggle. I want to end also by saying that colleagues in some universities, which we called historically disadvantaged institutions, have pointed out about us not forgetting about them and linking up with specific issues. We need to be contextual as well. I think it's also important that the state is now talking about autonomy but they mean something very different by them. They say we must take away their autonomy. By the way, I will, Neville Alexander spoke very eloquently about this notion about autonomy and academic freedom. We can't be autonom autonomous to the communities we are meant to serve. <laughs> and quite often, quite often, autonomy is more about managerialism. And for the academics in the universities that are spied upon, harassed, 
who have to produce more and more unreasonably more and more widgets in classes with hundreds of students especially that is not the kind of autonomy we are talking about or will support so the state is cutting funding and the universities say because of that we're going to have to have austerity measures at the university which will mean that the quality of teaching and learning and many other things will survive so let us not be caught in siding with one or the other i think we need to understand the dynamic of how a corporatized university works in a neoliberal society we need to understand who our allies are and who our enemies are and i have a lot more to say but aluta continue <laughs> well